Uh, I'm going to overlap a little bit with what Francois said, so just to review and get us all on the same page. So um, I apologize if you know that well, but hopefully you'll enjoy that. Okay, so the boundary of a hyperbolic group. Okay, so in general, this is a topological object that's going to be canonically associated with a hyperbolic group, and it's going to tell us a lot of information. So I'm going to show that this is a canonical object or topological object. It actually has a, also has a metric structure, which I won't go into today. And then I'm going to show some things that it's good for. What does it tell you? It tells you a lot. So the spoiler is a lot. Okay, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, relatively hyperbolic geometries. Okay, so this is going to be a lot. So I want to just quickly review this, and then I want to spend most of my time on what the boundary of a hyperbolic group actually tells you about that hyperbolic group. OK, so x is going to be a proper, proper is important. Geodesic isn't so important, but I'll usually be implicitly assuming it, um, hyperbolic metric space. So let me just give uh, three very common definitions. So definition one. Boundary X is the set of geodesic rays uh, from some point. The topology won't depend on the point. And modulo equivalence. Okay, and so what's that equivalence going to be? So we want the geodesic rays to be equivalent if they're in the same house or um, they have bounded Hausdorff distance. So let me just, a good example to keep in mind that I think you've done is H2, delta hyperbolic space. I'm going to have rays that go out here. And if I think about it, maybe I have some slightly wiggly hyperbolic space and there's some other geodesic ray that stays the same. And I kind of think it ends at the same point. If they stayed in the, house, the same Hausdorff distance, they would end at the same point in H2. Okay, so this is bounded Hausdorff distance. So I'll say that gamma 1 is equivalent to gamma 2 if the image of um, gamma 1 is contained in the neighborhood uh, of C of the image of gamma 2 and vice versa. There's some C that this works. Okay. So this is a good uh, definition just for getting your intuition. Um, something, so lots of times we're going to be dealing with quasi-isometry, so we're not going to want to have geodesic rays. So definition two is really similar to this. This is one that I'll use, and that's, I'm thinking about quasi-geodesic rays. So just quasi-geodesic rays. At some x not contained in x. Okay, and again, modulo the same equivalence. And this is bounded Hausdorff distance. Okay, so, um, so you can just think about wiggly rays and you want them to stay in some distance. So remember, that in a delta hyperbolic space, if I have a, a quasi-geodesic, it's within the bounded distance of some geodesic. Okay, so you can take a geodesic in this class if you have a geodesic metric space and just think about that. Okay, so let's think about definition three, which is the one I want to talk a little bit about. So now I'm, instead of thinking about the actual ray, I'm just going to think about points going off to infinity. So this turns out to be really useful. Often we think of a group as just 
the orbit of its point acting on some delta hyperbolic space. So we might just want to think about a bunch of points. Okay, it actually is very helpful. It's a little bit less intuitive, but it's um, very helpful. And this is uh, sequences go tending to infinity. Okay, so I'm going to look at, um, so let me just say what that means to tend to infinity. I'm going to look at, so the Grumov product, which I think you've seen, at least Indira was probably telling you about it. So I have x, y at some point p is just defined to be one half the distance, I'm in a metric space, x, p plus the distance y, p minus the distance x, y. So let's draw a little picture of this. So if I'm in, I'm in hyperbolic space, I've got some p. I'm going to look at my two points out here. And I'm going to have the distance from x to p, distance of y to p, minus the distance between them. OK, so I'm drawing a little picture in x, p. So notice when they get way um, far away, this distance is actually going to be going to infinity. OK, so th these will be big. And if they're close together, if they're sort of going to the same point, so this is sort of a idea of a proof that what happens if, if these are points along rays that are staying within bounded Hausdorff of each other, way out here, they're going to look exactly the same. OK, and this is going to go to infinity. OK, so uh, and another way to think about, a good way to think about the Gromov product, I think, is in a, is in a tree. So if I have. Uh, so if I have like, here's my P, and this is X. So I'm drawing part of the Cayley graph for F2, X and Y. OK, so let's look at what the Gromov product is here. OK, the distance from P to X, so like this is just going to be 3, right? This is going to be 1, 2. Uh, one, I wanted this to be four. One, two, three. One, two, three. I'm going to put another one here. <laughs> um, plus, okay, good. Um, plus uh, uh, four minus five, right? So this is going to be what? One. Okay, so what is this? So where's my geodesic between x and y? So this is a, it's, it's fun to do this in a tree if you haven't done this for a while. So the, this distance in this space is going to measure the distance from p to the geodesic from x to y, right? So here's my geodesic between x and y. I got to go through that point. Okay, and then here's this distance to 1 to that geodesic. Okay, so uh, in a tree you can start to see if I have, um, I want to look at sequences going to infinity. So let me say what that means. <coughs> I'm going to say that AI tends to infinity, or sometimes I'll write actually right arrow infinity, but I'll have lots of different points on the boundary. If the limit as I goes to infinity and J goes to infinity of AI, AJ, equals infinity. So that means whenever i and j are bigger than some number, then this is as big as I want it. OK, I can make that as big as I want. So it's a good I idea to play with that in uh, a tree. The tree is zero hyperbolic. Everything's kind of nice. Okay, erasers. Mm, tricky. All right. Oh, yeah, there's more board, too. <laughs> there's one more behind. Oh, there's even three. And then two. All right, I'll put some stuff on the side. <laughs> OK, so and then in the exercises, this, sh this shows that there's this is you can think of this as like thin rectangles to be thin. So definition, maybe I'll put this over here. 
um, x is delta hyperbolic. Uh, if and only if um, for all x, y, z, w, x, y of w is greater than or equal to the minimum of um, x, z, w, uh, y, z, w uh, minus delta. Okay, so you can think of, you can do everything you could never know about geodesics and be happy in a, in a um, hyperbolic metric space. Okay, i.e. thin rectangles. See the exercises. Okay, and also in a delta hyperbolic space, let me just write this down, I have in x delta hyperbolic, I have x y of p is going to be less than or equal to the distance between p and this, this notation here means the geodesic between x and y. And uh, this is x y plus delta. Okay, so in a zero delta hyperbolic space is, kind of is, is what you would, what you're starting to get thinking about the graph. Okay, so I'll leave these up here. I'm going to use this in a minute. All right. Yeah? Oh, I haven't said, I haven't finished. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, very good. Modulo equivalence, let me write that down. So I'll just write definition three and I'll say sequence is tending to infinity. Now I've said what that means. Now let me say modulo the equivalence. This is set. to infinity, and then I want to say that these sequences are equivalent if, if the lemma as i goes to infinity and j goes to infinity of a i uh, b j uh, equals infinity. Okay, so this is an equivalence relation on a, for a hyperbolic space. It's not necessarily equivalence relation if you don't have a hyperbolic space. Okay, so this it's not um, uh, completely obvious that this is transitive. Okay, so you need delta hyperbolicity. Okay, and then this is my set. Thank you. Okay, so um, now my, what I want to do, so this is just the boundary of a hyperbolic metric space. I want to think about the boundary of a group. So the boundary of a group that acts geometrically on a delta hyperbolic metric space, that's the definition of a hyperbolic group, but maybe it acts on different hyperbolic metric spaces, they'll all be quasi-isometric. I want the boundary to be well-defined. Not do I want just the set to be well-defined, I want the topology. So let me put a topology on it, and then I want to show that this is, or give you some idea why this is well-defined for the quasi-isometry type of the space. So now let's put a topology. And as Anna mentioned uh, yesterday, the, um, just like in H2, the isometries of the hyperbolic space are going to induce homeomorphisms of the boundary. And so that helps you see the action of the group um, really helpfully. OK, so what I want to do is I'm going to extend this Gromov product to the boundary. Okay, so I have uh, M, N of W. So M and N um, are uh, points on the boundary. Okay, this is going to be equal to the supremum over Xi tending to M. Okay, so what is Xi tending to M? That means the sequence Xi, its equivalence class, under this equivalence as a point in the boundary, is M. I won't write that, but that's what I mean by Xi tending to M. It means the equivalence class of the sequence Xi 
I'm calling that m, okay, because that's what points are on the boundary. And um, yi tending to n of, uh, this, of the lem mf xi uh, yj uh, w. Okay, so what that's supposed to be indicating is sort of like roughly the distance to this kind of geodesic out here as I, as I go out to it. That's a good way to think of this. Okay, why did I put supremum and imp just to be a pain in the butt? There's actually examples that maybe I should have put in the, um, in the exercises, but if you want, you can think about this space, which is quasi-isometric to z, so it has two points of the boundary. And you can find sequences going to positive and negative infinity so that this wouldn't be well-defined unless you did this. Okay, so that's a fun thing to play with, too. Okay, so you need that um, supremum and emph. I've actually seen in the literature emph of emph, but you need, um, you could have like zero and one going in that example. Okay, so now let's put a topology. Let's put a topology on this space using the boundary, the group using the boundary. Can you see this board under here? Okay, good. Hat, which equals x uh, union boundary x. Okay, so I want a compactification. So if you think, if you're an H3 person like me, you can think of x using the boundary as a solid ball. Okay, so um, I've got, if I have x is uh, some point in the big S, I'm going to just look at um, epsilon ball. So I'm going to look at a ball of radius r around x. So these are metric balls. This will be my, I'm doing a basis for the topology. Okay, and what about um, x contained in the boundary x? I'm going to have a neighborhood of r of x equals uh, y such that x, y, w is uh, greater than r. Okay, so some of these points y, okay, so what does this mean? Some of these points y could be in the boundary, right? Okay, so I'm going to have, I've got, uh, eventually I'll go an example that's not h2, so I have some point x in the boundary. Okay, so some of the points will be y in the boundary, such that this uh, Gromov product from some distance is very far, is very large. Okay, and some of these also, I want to get a little neighborhood here. I want to glue this boundary to the space. Okay, so some of these will be points. So if um, y is contained in the boundary of x, it's the definition above, this definition of the Gromov product, okay, above. Okay, if y is actually in x, then I use um, x, y of w is just going to equal the supremum as um, xi goes to x of um, the, um, the limb of um, xi and y, uh, w. Okay, so I just modify this definition so if one of them is in the space and one of them is at the boundary. I don't need to take both sequences, okay, because y is actually in the space. Okay. All right, so this, this is my topology and my space. This gives me a neighborhood basis. Okay. So, here's some facts. I'm not going to prove everything. I'll try to give you some idea why, if I have a quasi isometry of the spaces, we have a homeomorphism. Okay, so it turns out that when x is proper, did I just say something wrong? So, if x is proper, and um, I'm always assuming hyperbolic metric space, then we're going to have that. Um, x uh, hat and boundary x are compact, okay? They're also Hausdorff, so dx is also Hausdorff, okay? 
This is not so hard to prove. That is also not so bad. So I'm going to show that the map is continuous, that I have a continuous bijection when I have an isometry. Or show that. Oh, now I need to use my hook. So we're going to show that if our um, x is quasi-isometric to x, uh, then uh, there's a continuous map. So, and it's bidirection. Okay, so let me just outline that using the Gromov product. Okay. So let's let, uh, so I'm going to kind of go between definitions, so bear with me. So for the, for the um, just to define the map, I'm going to use the definition of quasi-geodesics. So we're going to let um, f takes x to x prime uh, be quasi-isometry. Uh, we call the inverse g. OK, so M, the equivalence class in the boundary, is represented by a quasi-geodesic ray. Uh, gamma. OK, so F, because this is a quasi-isometry, F of gamma is also a quasi-geodesic ray. OK, so I'm going to set um, boundary F of uh, the equivalence class of gamma uh, just equal to uh, the equivalence class of uh, F gamma. Okay, so this will be in boundary X. Okay, so now if, um, so I want to show that, so if I have two things that are equivalent, right, so if they're in bounded distance, so if distance, let me just say this real quick, I could have this exercise. If the Hausdorff distance between these two is less than k, okay, then the Hausdorff distance between gamma 1 and f of gamma 2 is going to be less than or equal to, say, lambda k plus c. Okay, so then this is a well-defined map. Okay, so if I look at the, and the inverse is also bounded, uh, g composed with f, of gamma and gamma, okay, is bounded. Okay, so this is a this is going to give me a bijection. Okay. So oh, now I get to use my hook. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's actually way better than the ones that have buttons because buttons, you can get mixed up. Now I'm just going to be messing with these all the time. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all, right. all right, so you know the definition now. Oh, you can't, which one do you want? Uh, all right. <laughs> oh, you know what I should do? I should do this. So now let's look at, I want to show that the preimage of an open set is open. I'm going to go back to my Gromov product definition where I use the topology. All right, so let's look at some Y uh, contained in, I want to show that if I have this like to sort, you can sort of think of this as like a delta, but that goes the other way. I want it to be big. It's going to imply um, that. Where am I? Uh, boundary up. This is my map. 
of y is contained in some other little neighborhood of boundary f of x. Okay, so I want to be able to get my neighborhood small enough around here so that I can get inside some open neighborhood in here. Okay, just like delta epsilon definition. So let's uh, look at the Grimlock product. So I have f of xi, f of yi. So here I'm thinking xi is going to be tending to x. This is equivalence class, and yi is going to be tending to y. It doesn't matter which sequences I choose. Okay, so I'm going to see how what this neighborhood looks like. I'm going to mess around with it to get something, thinking about how close I need to get the sequences x and y to be. Okay, this is f of uh, x naught greater than or equal to the distance f of x naught to. This means the geodesic f of x i, f of y i. Uh, minus delta. Okay, so that comes from this fact that I, uh, this inequality right here. Okay, so this, this means the geodesic between f of xi and f of yi. Okay, and um, this just equals, so there's some point on this geodesic that realizes this. So this is just equal to the distance between f of x naught and uh, t prime minus delta for some t, pi, some t prime on OK, because it's just realized. OK, so the image of this, of x i y i, is going to just be a quasi-geodesic. So this is the geodesic, but there's some quasi-geodesics. That's the image of the geodesic between x i y i. So this is going to be uh, greater than or equal to, which is within bounded distance of this geodesic. OK, this is going to be the distance between um, f of x naught, f of t. OK, so this is some point on the geodesic, uh, minus k minus delta, OK, where the, the actual geodesic between um, f of xi and f of yi is, within, is in the bounded distance of the um, image of the geodesic between xi and yi. Let me write that out. So for some t, because um, this maps to a geodesic. This maps to a quasi-geodesic. Uh-huh. Don't you just need to divide by lambda? Uh, no, this geodesic is in some. This is some, but this is not in any particular k. This is just, it's within some bound. So it's just some, some k. So it's not the k, if I used that k before, it's just, it's in a bounded distance. Okay, and this uh, k depends on that, what it, that quasi-geodesic constant is. I'm just not worrying about it right now. Okay, um, so this is going to be greater than or equal to now I'm going to use it. This is a quasi, this is my quasi geodesic <laughs> distance between x naught and t uh, minus c. So there's a there's a quasi geodesic. Okay, uh, minus k minus delta. Okay, so I just carry those down, and this is going to be equal to one over lambda. Okay. Uh, the distance between x naught and uh, x i y i, because this t was in x i y i. Um, mm, minus c minus k minus delta. Okay. Now. OK, so what did, we, what did that tell us? So look, that we related the, dis the Gromov product of the image to this Gromov product of the original thing. Uh, oh wait, maybe I missed a line. Oh yeah, I did miss a line. Let me put it on this thing. OK, so remember this. The distance to the geodesic between xi and yi 
is bounded by the Gramov product. So this is going to be this is x naught. This is again from that inequality over there uh, minus c plus k plus delta. Okay, so this no, this relates the Gromov product of the image to the Gromov product of the of the um, original thing. So we have if that Gromov product is bigger than that number, if x is going to be uh, greater than lambda times n plus c plus k plus delta. Okay, then, okay, so we're going to start off in this small neighborhood, okay, and I claim that we're going to get within a uh, uh, n neighborhood when we map in. So this is like the r from the beginning. Okay, then um, this is going to be uh, 1 over lambda xi uh, uh, y i at x naught is going to be greater than n plus c plus k plus delta. Okay, so this implies that 1 over lambda um, x i y i at x naught uh, minus c plus k plus delta is greater than n. Okay, and f, the Gromov product of the images, is bigger than this thing. Okay, so if I get in a small enough neighborhood, I can get my other thing in a small enough neighborhood that's continuous. Okay. All right. So now we have an invariant of the group. Okay, so now the boundary of G, uh, G acts geometrically on X, proper hyperbolic metric space. We have a well-defined, the boundary of G is just going to be defined to be uh, the boundary of any such X. Okay, so now we can go to town. So when this was figured out, I guess, by Gromov in his article where he uses Gromov product, um, the uh, people were wondering, what kind of stuff can this tell us? It actually can tell you a lot of stuff. Okay, this can tell you a lot. So let's look at some examples, some quick examples. Okay, so examples. So the boundary of a free group, say F2, is going to equal a Cantor set. So you can think about this if you want. I put a couple little exercises about this. And actually, so you can think about sequences going this way. You can start to have these like disjoint neighborhoods, and then you can get disjoint and disjoint. It's really fun. Think about this. And for a trivalent tree, it's a little easier if you like the um, if you like the uh, middle thirds Cantor set, which everybody is prejudiced towards. <laughs> um, and then actually, um, if uh, G is hyperbolic. And um, boundary of G is equal to a Cantor set, then G is virtually free. Okay, so another nice example is um, the boundary of some um, group, closed surface group, like you saw yesterday. So a closed surface group acts geometrically. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tiles uh, H2. Okay, so the boundary of a closed surface group is going to equal uh, S1. Okay, the boundary of H2. And if um, boundary of G equals S1 and G is hyperbolic, uh, then uh, G is virtually a surface group. This is much harder. This is uh, goodbye, Tukia. Uh, 
Pass and Jen Grease. A lot of work, a lot of non-trivial work. OK, so some open problems that you can immediately start formulating as soon as you know the definition. So you can take your favorite boundary and try to figure out all the things that have that boundary. So uh, problem. Boundary M, which will be a, you'll need a piano continuum. I have to have a lot of symmetry, okay? And uh, which hyperbolic G have the boundary of G homeomorphic uh, to M? Okay, so one, uh, one interesting question that you might want to work on that's actually been resolved. So this, um, this proof about quasi-isometry shows that if the groups are quasi-isometric, then they have homeomorphic boundaries. Okay, it is, there are examples of quasi-isometric, of non-quasi-isometric groups that have homeomorphic examples, so be a little careful. Okay, that will use the quasi-conformal structure at infinity that I'm not going into, but they exist. Okay, and then you might even wonder, maybe you take your favorite uh, space and you want to know is, um, so an easier version of this, maybe this is the empty set, is um, the boundary of anything, of any hyperbolic group. So maybe um, or characterize the spaces which um, occur. Okay, there's been some work done on this. Okay, those are both kind of hard, but there's things you can start thinking about. All right, so when we th one thing that you can see is you can see uh, the boundaries of subgroups. So the geometry of subgroups is really interesting, and uh, certain subgroups you can see in the boundary very nicely, so let me go over that. <laughs> the geometry of subgroups can really tell you a lot about the group, and I'm happy to go on about that uh, later. I like thinking about geometry of subgroups. Of subgroups. So some of these subgroups you can actually see in the boundary. For example, uh, if you have, you can kind of think I've got a Z in here. Let me just do this example. Okay, if I have two points in the boundary that are invariant by that G, I can see the boundary of G. What's the boundary of Z? Two points, good, and it's right there. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not distinguished from any other two points, but it is there. It might not be easy to see, but it's there. Okay, so these, this is an example of a quasi-convex subgroup, so let me just say what that is. So a subset A. of a geodesic matrix space is, uh, I'll say, E quasi-convex, and I won't care about the E. OK. If uh, any geodesic. A1, A2, and X. So where A1 and A2 are in my subset A um, between points of A. Is a bounded distance from A. So in E. So is distance E from A. an E neighborhood of A. Okay, so the picture you might want to have in mind is some kind of blob. Okay, it might not be convex, 
but it's quasi-convex. Okay. So, and then I'm going to say A, so all my quasi-convex subgroups are going to be infinite, so A, an infinite group, subgroup, is quasi-convex. If it's um, if it is quasi-convex in some Cayley graph, so G is going to be finitely generated. If it is quasi-convex in the Cayley graph of um, G S, or S is some finite generating set. So. Um, I'm being a little careful here. I won't have to be careful in a minute. Um, but I haven't said anything about hyperbolic yet. So there are actually groups that can be quasi-convex in one generating set and not the other. So that's horrible. So let's <laughs> go to hyperbolic groups. <laughs> so for hyperbolic groups, we can just say, oh, it is quasi-convex in some group, some space on which the group acts geometrically, which is what we like. So if G is hyperbolic, doesn't depend on on S, and I can think A quasi convex because I'd rather think about just some space, my favorite space on which the group acts geometrically, if and only if the orbit of A A X naught is quasi-convex in X, where G acts geometrically on X. So X itself will be hyperbolic, if it acts geometrically. OK, so this is just pick some point and then move it around by your subgroup. OK, so um, let's talk about how we could get something. So now we have a hyperbolic group. We've got a wonderful boundary. We can think, what, how is this going to tell us about the, um, the boundary? So the limit set. So A contained in G hyperbolic. The limit set, you could talk about the limit set of some subset of X, but let's just think about an orbit here. I'm going to have the orbit of some point is going to be a, um, a subset of X. OK, and then the limit set of the subgroup A is just going to equal all the equivalence classes of sequences that just come from that orbit. OK, so let me just write that down. The equivalence class of sequences where xi is somehow in this, say, this orbit. OK, so for example, yesterday you saw a quasi-Fuchsian group here where you had um, some group, a surface group, that actually was acting on um, H3, but wasn't exactly like acting as PSL2Rs. Was acting in PSL2C, and the limit set here was still topologically a circle, because it'll turn out that this, um, when the group is quasi-convex, this is a um, this is going to be a quasi-convex subset. I'll say what I mean by this. But this was the limit set of the orbit of that subgroup of PSL2C. Okay, so example quasi-Fuchsian. OK, and this has been used for uh, Kleinian groups for a long time to understand a lot about the subgroups. OK, so the, the limit set was really used in Kleinian groups. In fact, in my mind, the, the whole definition of the boundary is a generalization of the limit set of a Kleinian group. OK, so, uh, so let me just say one thing. So I'm on my own time frame, so, but I'll stop in like two minutes. Is that OK? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so let's talk about the quasi-convex subgroups. OK, so now I have, I have this x, uh, proper hyperbolic. And I have some uh, closed subset of the boundary. 
I can look at the convex hull of N, which is going to equal the union of A, B. Now, what do I mean by these A, Bs? Okay, so I want to look at lines between points on the boundary in this set. So we're A, B, R, and N. Okay, so in a hyperbolic space, so if I have A, B contained in the boundary of X, um, there exists, this is geodesic space, uh, there exists a bi-infinite geodesic. And you can get these by approximating the sequences tending to these two points. Um, R, I, uh, so R that takes negative infinity to infinity to X. And I want this side of the sequence to converge to A and this side of the sequence to converge to B. So I mean the limit as I goes to infinity of R negative I equals A. Okay, so this means that the sequence R to the negative I, its equivalence class is A. And the limit as I goes to infinity of R of I equals B. So I can't stop drawing H2, but it looks like this. Okay, and I have this geodesic. Okay, so to form the convex hull, I'm going to take all of those lines between points of the boundary. Okay, and we're going to call this AB. Okay, so um, the, this is the convex hull. Okay, so if I have a, um, if I have a, so let's give some definitions for quasi-convex. Did I say what a quasi-convex subgroup was? I want the orbit to be quasi-convex. Did I say that? Okay. Yeah? Uh, in this AB, do we pick, choose a geodesic, or do we take all that may exist? Uh, take all of them if you want. So there, and it's going to be fine. <laughs> a set of lines between points. OK, so just proposition about what happens with quasi-convex groups. Um, so if I have G acting geometrically on X, so the convex, so if I have uh, quasi-convex subgroups of G, of G are hyperbolic. So I like to think of this, so that it turns out that the convex hull of the limit set of a quasi-convex subgroup is going to be itself uh, delta hyperbolic with maybe some other delta. It's quasi-convex. And you can think of the group acting on that, or you can think of the group acting on its orbit, if you like, because that's quasi-convex. And that's going to be a hyperbolic space for this, uh, for this subgroup, and it acts geometrically on that. So um, A contained in G is quasi-convex. Exactly when, so I can think of this convex hull, the convex hull of the limit set of A, remember that's the limit set of things coming from the orbit, all over A, has finite diameter. Okay, so this is exactly analogous to what happens in H3, where you have a limit set, you take the convex hull of the limit set, this gives you a space that it acts on, your group acts on it, and downstairs you get a compact manifold. Okay, in general, we're not going to get a manifold, but we'll get some object that's compact. Okay, so that's why the geometry of it is easier to deal with. And also we have that if A contains in G is quasi-convex, then the boundary of A is going to embed in the boundary of G, which just equals the limit set of A. 
Okay, so we have these hyperbolic subgroups and we can see their boundaries in the boundary of our whole group. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me just introduce, talk one minute on the next topic, or I'll just stop. I can just stop right there. <laughs>